I'm a faculty member in the College of Engineering, and I work at the department called Engineering Education's department. Um, and to give you some background about myself, because I think knowing the background will help you to see all the biases that I'm going to say <laughs> during these sessions. Uh, my background, my undergraduate and my master degree program is actually in electrical engineering. Uh, but my uh, PhD is no longer engineering. So my PhD is in education. So uh, my role, my biggest role here at Utah State is more on the research rather than in teachings. And my interest, research interest is more on cognitions, trying to understand how engineering students uh, solve problems, how engineering students uh, think. And my research is in that area, uh, trying to find something, better way to improve uh, teaching and learning in engineering. So I think by knowing my background, I think you will be able to see all these biases that I'm going to talk about during my presentations. Uh, I was asked, I was invited by the city to uh, share some of my uh, experiences in uh, developing an online learning and also teaching online learning. And f unfortunately, those experiences are not here at Utah State, but it's a, at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. But I do conduct several, I have conducted several workshops. So some of the slides here is taken from uh, the workshop that I conducted uh, in many different countries uh, for the last few years. So. Let's get started. The topics for today is pedagogical concern in online learning. Uh, City was kind enough to give me some kind of freedom. What topic do you want to talk about? And I always interested in, in, in pedagogical concern or more about the cognitive sides uh, uh, in online learning because uh, based on my experiences overseas, I also, I've always found people, whenever people talk about online learning, they always start talking about, oh, do I create a video clips? You know, I put the PowerPoint in such a way that can deliver the content with all the voices, with all those fancy animations, you know, all those kind of things. So I get the impressions whenever we talk about online learning, we, people start immediately talk about, think about technology. And I'm not quite interested in technology, to be honest with you, even though I work some with the technology, but I think we should focus more on how to improve learning uh, in the learning, online learning environments. So that's the reason I choose these topics. And of course, this is not going to be a complete topic. There's a lot of hole here. I try to copy and paste and try to make some adjustments. Some of the slides came from the uh, one year workshop last year, last summer. Uh, so let's see what happened, okay? So I would really interested if you can stop me at any time and then we, we can clarify things and discuss things here. All right, so let's start with the definition first. Uh, there's a lot of definition out there and I know, I believe you also see a lot of definition about online learning. And uh, some of them are very similar some of them are very different. So let's start with the one definitions that we can agree on, at least for today's sessions. Uh, I choose this online learning definition because I think it's simple. So uh, this is by the Trinity College at Cambridge. Uh, they said that online learning, including web-based learning, can be viewed as supporting a learning experience. So that's a kind of a loaded word, a learning experience by either developing or applying information and communication technology, or ITC. So basically, if we agree on these definitions, any kind of learning experience that you would like your students to have by uh, using all this ICT should be, can be considered as an online learning. Okay. So, Again, this is also basic things about type of web based on online courses. And uh, I believe in the morning sessions, uh, there's a session talking specifically about this, but let's make it everything simple here. So 
the way I look at the web-based type of web-based or online courses, I divide it into three. The first one is a face-to-face -face with some web-based instructions. I think many of us use this in our classrooms, in our class here at Utah State University. The second one is about web-based instruction with some on-site requirements. So the emphasis is more on the web-based. And the third one is purely web-based instructions, which mean that no face-to-face -face interaction at all. All right, so let's begin with how web-based learning. I'm using web-based now rather than online, so probably just curious why you're switching the terminology. Well, most of the time when we say online, we are thinking more on the web. So any information that can be accessed through web browsers. So I'm changing a little bit with web-based because I think most of our online is a web-based kind of a learning environment. So how web-based learning is different than classroom learning? I think this is very basic. Everybody know. I'm sure you do also know this. The first one is to create a clear pathway of learning for students. So what do we mean with that? Basically, uh, it meant that it means that uh, students have the ability. Students have the ability to choose when to come into the course. So they 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 decide when they will do that and how they're going to do uh, take the course or start doing a lesson plan or something. Uh, learning activity or say. Second one is the design of online course become much more important than its classrooms. So probably some of you disagree with that, but I do believe that since there is a lack of face-to-face -face interactions, uh, the design becoming more difficult because we need to think about many different things that normally can be addressed easily through face-to-face, -face, but not anymore on uh, online or web-based environment. So the design is becoming very difficult, or, in, or probably I should not use the word difficult, it's, it's becoming more important. The, sec, the third one is the learner center environment of the online course that has a number of phases. I think everybody agrees in this. And every time we said online learning is always self-selected, which means that students can choose uh, when they're going to do that, where they're going to do that, and then what topic they're going to go first or should they skip any specific topics? And again, this is very general uh, definitions, but uh, you probably think about what happened if this is at Utah State where everything has to be uh, structured. They cannot skip any, any unit. Well, then probably there is a limitation of the self-selected phases on this online then. The second one is the time. I think we mentioned that. They can do at any time. They can choose. the we're going to start working on their learning experience during in the evening, on the early in the morning, and also where. So the place is also flexible. And pace, how fast, how slow they can choose. And the last one, I think, is around the clock, which means that they, they can do it any, any times. This is actually create another problem since this is around the clock. So for some reason, when students are working in the morning and then they start learning, doing some taking classes during the evening, some kind there is an expectation from the students to have a feedback, immediate feedback from the professors. So when they email you uh, 10 o'clock or 12 o'clock in the evening, they would like to ex they expect to have a feedback, immediate feedback from the professors. So this is not actually create another problems because uh, normally we do not respond to anything at the midnight time. So. We can address this probably later in the next slide or the next few slides. The next one is online teachers act more like a facilitator than just an instructor. Okay. And the next one, course content required these components, chunkability, which means you put it into several pieces, and then repeatability, they can repeat it, and possibility, they can stop, start, and resume anytime they want. And of course, it's understandability which makes sure that we have a clear, direct instructions on our online uh, learning materials. And the last one, students in web-based course are more responsible. This is based on the research. Many research has been conducted, and they found that students start realizing it that once they're taking online class, they are 
expected to be more responsible and need enough discipline to come to class by logging in and working through the contents. This is what I said in the beginning of the sessions. Whenever I talk about, when I design a learning, uh, online learning, I always start thinking about learning more than teachings. Okay, so if we use this paradigm, if we develop an online learning, or it's not even online, even in classroom situations, if we switch our paradigm by looking at, um, focus more on the learning, everything else followed, it will change. Okay, so I think this is a word from Graf in 2011. And once prospect, prospective teachers have thought clearly about what it will look after students to demonstrate understanding, they teach completely different. Okay. So again, start from learning design, not the technology design. I know this is probably uh, <laughs> uh, Travis will disagree with me because some people who are focused on technology, they, they said that technology is the important part of the online. But for my side, I would say that the learning design is more important than anything else. Because at the end of the day, the reason we have online is for students, our learners, to be able to learn. So where does it start? Okay. So there's a lot of issue here. First of all, I think this is an old issue about user center versus designer centers. I think most of us here at Utah State, we are, if we want to create an, or develop an online, we normally is going to choose on the designer design rather than the user design. But if you work in industry, when you have a client and your client requires you to design or ask you to design a training, online training modules, then probably you want to go toward the user center. So what is the difference between user center and the design center? I think what it says here is very clear. That if you choose you want to use the user design center, then means that you have to include your students as part of your negotiation process on the design process. So everything has to be negotiated. It has to be, we have to receive feedback from use the students, how they learn, and those gonna impact, it's gonna somehow change or influence the way we design our online class. But as I said before, I think most of us here at Utah State, we are more toward the design, designer design, which means that we as the teachers play the important role here with the uh, people like Travis who, who help us uh, transforming some of the content using the technology. So the, the focus is a little bit different here. The next one, I think, is like I said repeatedly, it's not, it's not about what we will teach. Again, this is based on my experience whenever I talk about online learning, people start thinking about, well, we have so much, we have so many materials, classroom, face-to-face. -face. What I need to do now, actually, just simplify, just simply con convert it all the learning materials into online environments. So people start thinking about, well, let's focus more on the content. I don't think I agree with that. I think what we, we will teach will follow after the next one. So it always starts with what do we need our students to learn. So of course, to answer that question is, we need to have a well-developed curriculum. And the next slide is going to talk about curriculum development process. I'm not going to talk about in great details, but I just want to share with you uh, one of the models. I know there are many different curriculum models, different models out there. But I just want to share with you that it's simple to follow, easy to do, and it's more like engineering-like kind of process, if you will. Again, this is my biases again. So some of you probably have heard this kind of a model. They call it a backward design. Okay, so why backward? Why we have to use this model? Why I would like to share with you about this backward design? Well, let's think about the travel planning. It's an analogy, for example. If we want to go overseas, so our from framework here should focus on when we go traveling overseas, we probably want to focus on the culture goals rather than oh, I would like to visit Bali, I would like to visit Bangkok, or I would like to visit Paris, whatever. So it starts with the focus more on what is the goal here. It's not just the visit that's the goal, but something de 
something implicit, if you will. So how do we apply this mindset into educational purposes then? So we cannot say how to teach. That's too premature to talk about how to teach or which materials or activities to use is the first step. But rather, I would suggest to start with the desired result. So what is this? If we can specify the desired result first with this, the learning goals, the purpose, then, the, then focus on the content method activities and achieve how, uh, activities to achieve the result later. So these are, if I want to transfer that into graphical uh, information, I would say that, well, there are only three steps, essentially. The first one is identify the desired result. The second one is then we have to determine acceptable evidence if that result has been accomplished or not. And then the next one is plan learning experience and instructions. And I circled that uh, step number three because I think this is most of the issues about pedagogical concern here, about how do we plan learning experience, what kind of activities. Probably I should change that word instructions because it looks like one way. So it's more about how do we divine, uh, how do we design uh, uh, the learning experiences and, and, uh, and uh, yeah, learning experiences for our students. Is that okay, too fast, too slow? Should I just move on? Questions, no? Okay, thank you. Okay, so there are many different, uh, different pedagogical concerns here. Uh, these are a few critical issues that need to be considered when we develop an online learning. The first one, I think everybody should agree this, it doesn't have to be online, even face-to-face. -face. We need to define the, act, the aims and objective of the course. And this will include asking serious questions like the purpose of the online components, the way in which the design needs to meet the needs of the students, something like that. Questions that is dealing with why we need to have this course. <laughs> what are the goals? What are the objectives? Okay. The, the next one is asking ourselves again, I call it inter, in, interrogations, interrogating the nature of the content of the course. So we should ask ourselves a question, something like, in which uh, the technology can enhance, what technology can enhance, enhance students' understanding of the content in the processes of the inquiry which lead to new discovery about the content area. And we're probably gonna ask further questions like, how should we demonstrate and communicate what they have discovered? Are we gonna do it through presentations for each at the end of the semester or what. We'll also need to be made and may be considered as assessment items as well. So this is the first uh, two critical issues that we need to address when we, when we develop an online learning materials. The next one is articulating a set of belief about learning. I like this number three issues very much because I'm sure everybody have a learning belief within ourselves. And whatever belief, learning belief we have is gonna somehow dictate the way we design our learning experiences. I can give you examples. Uh, this is the time that I would like to probably sh uh, switch to another slide. Uh, one of the professor in uh, mechanical engineering here at Utah State, he developed uh, a online learning materials from scratch and he believed that it's, this is completely online, okay, completely web-based. And he believed that he has to teach his students using mastery learning. See, this is, he picked he pick a learning theory already, mastery learning. So, so if you are just asking what is mastery learning means, it's, it's basically he said that I do not accept B, for example. I would like to, I expect that at the end of the semesters, all of my students should be able to do this, 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 and this with 95% or even 100% success. So the mastery learning is, looks like the master of Kung Fu. So when you learn in Solin Temple, you, you read that a lot of story about Solin Temple, 
the, the guru, the teachers, the Shaolin Temple, the Kung Fu teacher is a master, they call it. I would like you to be like me, or you're not even better. Okay? So these professors, using that kind of learning theory, and the way he designed that, because it's a learning belief for him, he designing from the very beginning, they would like to make sure that they're not allowing the students to move from one topic to another topic until they get 100% on that. Even yet, even, even I would say it's really, really genius for me, I think, he said that I did not allow my students to do homework until I know for sure he get all the concepts. So if I may, how is my time here? Because I can talk more and more and I just lose time here. I'm OK? About 30 minutes. OK, so I have to move a little faster, so if you do not mind. I just want to show you, this is the slide I, I just took his slide because I don't think this is, I took his slide because he shared with us, actually, in, in the College of Engineering uh, a, few year, a few weeks ago, and everybody have this slide, so uh, I just have an idea this after, actually last night that why don't I share this with you, and I don't think he mind at all. So let me, let me, let me share with you what, he, what I'm talking about. So this is the mastery learning by Dr. Alan Gates. Probably some of you know him. Uh, so he has, if I can see it, it's so small. So you can see that the mastery learning and then the assignment completion exam in grade. You see that uh, there is extra credit if quizzes pass the first time, remedial instruction if unsatisfactory. So they want to make sure that if students cannot do well for some certain level, then they have to, they force students to, to do it again, to study the materials again. And then they take the quiz and so on, okay? I think this is probably even better. You can see that this is the way they designed the course. So you, uh, the thing that I would like to show, with you, show you here is they do not allow students to take quiz. I'm sorry, they do not allow students to, take, uh, to do their homework until they take a formative uh, assessment, some kind of a quiz. And then after they reach certain percentage success rate, then they, the system will automatically allow the students to, to, do the, uh, to do the homework. Okay. All right, so this is what I mean with the learning belief. Okay. And the next one is outlining the way in which the new technology will be used, of course. Okay, so then the technology come to play here because we want to know what existing technology can help me to convey or to implement the learning belief that I have in mind for my students. Is the chat room, chatting technology is good? Do I need to create the video clips? What do I need to do here? Okay. And then the next one is considering how, how learning will be evaluated. This is also important. Uh, and again, taking the example from Dr. Gates, when he used the learning theory as a mastery learning, at the end of the day, the, when they assess it, when he assessed his class, he used the same learning, in, uh, learning belief, which is a uh, mastery learning. So there is a, there is a link between, between the activity and the assessments. And the next one is a proposed active learning. Okay, this, this is kind of a buzzword. Everybody talk about active learning. And promote active learning, I, I have something here from the teacher perspective, from us. So offer the opportunity to practice, work with others, and experience new knowledge. And of course, active learning provide more autonomy to the students. And active learning, uh, we as a teacher, is becoming the facilitator. And of course, there is an organization, specific organization and preparation time or uh, effort that we need to do. What about the the active learning from the student perspective. So the learner active involvement, participations. I remember this a few years back in, in 1998. And in, in, in Singapore, when, when I conducted a workshop about student-centered learning, uh, when we talk about, I do not know what happened here. Should I just close it, Travis? Is that you? <laughs> OK. So the, the, when we talk about active learning, they start talking about, oh, we just shift our job. We no longer need to teach because 
the work is becoming on the, uh, is more on the students' uh, shoulder rather than ours. So I do not know how to do this. They keep doing this. So. And that's not the truth, actually. That's not the truth, actually. So, so the learning active, invol learner active involvement doesn't mean that the teacher is becoming less work. Uh, learner act motivations, which is more in the intrinsic motivations, and take ownership on her and his learning has to be more accountable, responsible, and social interactions, collaborations, teamwork, learning transfer, they focus more on the learning transfer, high cognitive level, critical thinking, and again, there is always certain type of organization and preparations effort that they need to do for this. Okay, this is the, 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 the behaviors and constructive views. Again, uh, I think, Behaviors view, when we talk about behaviors view, is more about that uh, this approach is often pictured as the teacher imparting information through the lectures or notes. We just give all the information to students and let them digest that. And it's generally more passive for learners. The constructive view is more on the learner construct their own meanings. And how do we do that? Well, uh, learning, new learning is, should be built on the prior learning or prior knowledge and learning enhanced by the social interactions and meaningful learning developed through authentic tasks. Uh, do we need to, can we create both? Well, actually, based on my experience, we use both of them. We are not really developed purely constructive dispute because it's very hard to do that. And, and especially for our, our undergraduate students, I don't think we, sh can exactly everything follow the constructive view. In fact, if you use the constructive view, you cannot have a learning objective. Because as soon as you set create a learning objective by the end of this module, our students should be able to, that's starting the first, that actually is more, more behavior rather than constructive view. So, so I would suggest that probably balancing between applying behaviors and constructive is probably is a good idea. So it's not going to be a pure constructive piece. Okay. So this is, uh, this is one of the study uh, by Ru in 2010 about the case study in constructive instructional strategy and for online learning. I thought it's nice to share this finding with you. Uh, he found that the lacking sufficient technology skill hindered students to actively partic participate in any learning activities. I think this is also found in many other studies. So it's very important that make sure that our students are, uh, what is the word here? They have to be competent, if you will, familiar with the technology that they are, need to use for the online. And then compared to face-to-face, -face, interacting with peers online was rather time-consuming, which is true. Okay. The students realized that they were re required to manage their own learning needs, designing on their own learning breadth and depth and engagement level, enhancing ideas and thought in peers' weekly report appear to be uh, the most common benefit. And the tension between course requirement and student motivation this is always a challenge. And they also, uh, this, finding, this study also found that more flexible instruction strategies are required. There's a lot of study dealing with this, and I just cannot take all of this in the slide. So if you're interested, I can give you a lot of uh, literatures about this. In fact, I can give you the whole instructor, I mean, the, the completes uh, for this. Just, just let me know at the end, I will send you emails. This is from Merrill. I, I always like this uh, paper. And by the way, Merrill is a professor here at Utah State. Uh, so the Merrill first principle of instruction. So, so Merrill said that it has to start with the authentic task. In this case, it's a problem. So it starts with the activations of the prior knowledge, all those kind of things, and then demonstration, application, integration. Let me, let me uh, move on to the next slides. Hopefully this is gonna help us trying to understand what are those pictures mean. So learning is facilitated. Basically, Meryl said that learning is facilitated when learners are engaged in solving real world problems. Okay, so it's a problem center. And he also that, say that, uh, and 
I said the show test, test level, you can have a progression of the level of difficulty of the problems. And then learning is facilitated when existing knowledge is activated as a foundation of, for new knowledge, activations. So again, this is more about uh, trying to connect what they have now and what they are plan uh, what they're gonna know uh, new knowledge, or so try to link all those together. So the previous previous experience and new experience and structures. Uh, new knowledge is demonstrated by the learner. I we just call it show me. Okay, demonstrates consistency, learner guidance, and relevant media. And the next one is applied by learner. So let me do things. Okay, uh, so practice consistency, diminishing coaching, and varied problems. And the next one is integrated into the learner's work with this integration, which is always difficult. Uh, so they have, uh, the key word probably just watch me. And reflections, if we create some kind of a learning activity in our online that force students or ask students to reflect, basically we're trying to do this, integrate into the learner's world. And for engineering, for example, we do a lot of design problems, so it's creations things is also uh, integrations of what they have known. Okay, I think this is the last uh, seven slide that I'm gonna share with you. The seven principle, this is very common. Uh, I think this uh, articles by Chickering and Gamson, even though it's old, 1987, but has been used multiple times in recent literatures about online. Even though when, when Chickering and Gamson talk about uh, seven principle, I don't think they specifically talk about online that time because probably in 1987 that online is not really developed yet, or definitely exists probably. Uh, so what are the seven principles of good practice by Chikrit and Gamsons? The first one is good practice encourages contact between student and faculty. I think everybody agree with that. Can we do that online? That's a question that we need to ask. Good practice develop reciprocity and cooperation among students. Again, the same question we should ask ourselves. How do we do that in online learning? Uh, the third one is a good practice uses active learning technique. We talked about this before a little bit. The next one is a good practice gives prompt feedbacks. Good practice emphasize time on tasks. Good practice communicate high expectations. And good practice respect diverse talents and ways of learning. So I try to put all these seven principles into our context and online. So there is a paper uh, written by the uh, group of people in the Center of Teachings at the University of Iowa. And again, if you are interested in this article, I will be more happy to uh, send it to you. Uh, so this is a seven principle of effective online teaching. So they put all those seven principles into the online learning environments. So the first one, encourage contact between students and faculty. So lesson for online instructions. So the instructors should provide clear guidance for interaction with students. Establish policy describing what kind of communication are to take place in different channels. Give you some kind of a, uh, experience, my best experience is, normally when we talk about what kind of communication we have, we normally tell the students more than one channel because we have to make sure that if what happened, if for some reasons they have a, for example, if I have a synchronous session with our students, okay, and, and we did, we have a 90 minutes each week uh, synchronous session through web-based kind of uh, instruments. So if something goes wrong, and, and believe me, it always goes wrong. So we always have a backup. So we have to tell the students, do not create panic. So if something wrong on your end or our end, during the synchronous sessions, let's go to Yahoo Messenger, for example, or go to Google or whatever. So we need to tell them what are the options if one channel fail. Set clear standard for instructor timelines for responding to messages. Principle number two, develop recipro uh, reciprocity and cooperation among students. So how are we gonna do that in online instruction? Well-designed discussion, assign, assignment, facilitate meaningful cooperation among students. Uh, learners should be required to participate, and their grades should reflect these requirements. Yeah, I heard a lot of people here at Utah State share ideas with me of, uh, last spring, and they said, well, we do a single session, but this didn't work. Uh, 
Well, actually, it's not really synchronous. It is a synchronous, but it's not really a synchronous lecture or synchronous sessions, but it's more about office hour. And nobody show up in the office hour. Well, well, if it's office hour, then it's probably, if they, they probably do not participate that quite often. But if we do want to have a, a synchronous, synchronous interaction with our students, then we probably need to schedule a synchronous sessions uh, regularly and, and make sure that participations in that kind of synchronous sessions is part of their grade. Again, this is more on behaviors than <laughs> constructivism. Uh, discussions should focus on tasks, and tasks should result in a product. So it has to be something tangible. Okay, so students know what they are expected to do during the, uh, uh, when they work together with their students. Learners should receive feedback on their discussions from the instructor. Grades should, be based, grades should be based on the quality of postings, not on the length or number. This is, this is also happening many years ago. People start writing a paper on the discussion thread and on our discussion, uh, web-based discussion board. And, and, and that's, that's hard to read because it's too long. Okay? And we need to tell them that, well, it's not the length that matter, it counts, but actually the quality of your postings. Instructors should post its expectation for discussions. Principle number three, uses active learning technique. How do we do that in online? So project is one of them. Projects are often part of face-to-face -face course, but the online learning instructors should provide opportunity for project to be shared asynchronously so that students can learn from each other. That's one, of the, one way to do it, but there are many different other uh, techniques. Uh, principle number four, give prompt feedback. Instructors need to provide two types of feedback, information feedback and acknowledgement feedback. Uh, based on my experience, this is more on the social sciences than the engineering. I never receive acknowledgement feedback in engineering based on my past experience. So this is probably new for most of the engineering uh, faculty because uh, when we say feedback, normally we talk about the information feedback rather than external feedback. So the information feedback provides information or evalua evaluations, while acknowledged feedback confirms that some event has occurred. Uh, when time constraint increases or increase as the semester progresses, instructor can still give prompt feedback on assignment by respond responding it to the whole class, right? not to the individual. Principle number five, emphasize says time on tasks. Regularly announce deadline. Encourage students to spend time on tasks and help students with busy schedule avoid uh, procrast, pro, I, I have a difficulty to pronounce this, procrastinations. And I think technology help us on this because uh, we can set up technology to keep reminding students, to keep reminding students reminding students about the, the, the next uh, due, la, due date for certain uh, assignments. So we do not need to do it ourselves. Uh, principle number six, communicates high expectations. Provide students with models to follow along with comments explaining why the examples are good. Public say, uh, praising exemplary work, communicate high expectations. So basically just saying that the challenging tense sample, we need to, to communicate uh, the high expectations. The number seven, I think this is also important, which is always difficult to do, is to respect diverse talents and ways of learning. Allowing students to choose project topics, incorporate diverse view into online courses. Instructor can provide guidelines to help students select topics relevant to the course while still allowing students to share their unique perspective. Uh, I think that's it. How is my time? Is that bad? Is that okay? Okay, good. So do we still have time for question and answers? Yes, yes, question and answers. Okay. Any comments, questions? I'd like to learn from you too. I'm sure you have some experience in developing online. That is probably different than mine. Yes, please. Yeah, we try to, we try to be uh, 
as consistent as the way we define one credit hours in face-to-face, -face, if I'm not mistaken, I think one credit hour should be equal more or less like three hours, including the structure, so one credit probably 50 minutes, which is considered one hour face-to-face -face and two hours structure and structure activity outside the classroom. We try to be consistent with that because as, as, soon, as, you, as soon as you ask students to do more than that for three credit hours, people start complaining based on my experience. So we try to do that. So if we do not have a synchronous sessions, in my experience, I did have a synchronous session once a week for 50 minute, uh, 90 minutes. So then the activity outside that synchronous session is more or less like another two hours that we expect them to do. And one more thing that is related with that, again, this is based on my experience, probably not really true for all classes. Uh, people really get tired when they, uh, when they take an online class for the whole semester, like 16 weeks or 15 weeks. Well, in the past, we have like a 15 weeks long online. And then for some reason, we start getting feedback from our students that is too long, it's too difficult for them to manage their time. Again, this is based on my experience, but most of them are, I would not say most, all of them are professionals. So this is a master level students. And they start giving us feedback and then we start to string the, the 16, the 15 week, I couldn't exactly remember, to only like uh, 10 weeks or nine weeks long session, a semester. So it's, it's shorter uh, and they seem to like that one better than than uh, 16 weeks long semesters. And I'm sure that's probably not possible here at Utah State. Yes? That's an interesting approach in structuralism because it seems like engineering would be so content based that it's hard to let them socially construct meaning about it. But then on top of that, online learning, where you have these discrete modules and sort of this behavior controlled. You're right. That is an interesting question that, uh, <laughs> starting this spring, I'm gonna develop my first engineering online class. So uh, to be honest with you, I do not have specific concrete examples, how do we do that to, in, uh, to, to uh, implement the constructivist view in our online for engineering students yet. But I think we can do it in many different ways about constructivist. So basically uh, we can, uh, we can, for example, engineering design. In, engineering a lot do a lot of engineering design. And design, essentially, there's no right or wrong answers. There are many different ways to, to meet the goals of the engineering problem. So that's, that's kind of constructivist. And then we ask them to work in the group, which normally that's what happened in our class here, face-to-face. -face. Engineering students work in the three or four people work to design a, a specific task. So I think what is, Interesting, which is always difficult, is to develop the, the activities, the learning activities, which we claim to be constructivist. What is a constructivist kind of learning activity that we want to develop? I think this is the most difficult one. We need to find one. And, 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 and yeah, I think that's, that's, that's my answer for now. Yes. Yeah. 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 There's always a cons there's always a tensions there between when we said it's a people can choose their own teaching materials if they know already why should I go which why should I follow the linear models that's what you're saying it's always a tension on that so. If you ask me personally, what should I go about that kind of situation, I would probably combine it. So I would suggest to our students, they allow, I allow them to move faster if they, if they can, uh, if they finish with module one, for example, they can move for module two, even though we are still in module one. But I, for the sake of the classrooms, I would like them to participate when we are in the module one, even though they are in module two already. So, in my opinion, I think we need to balance between, between giving them freedoms to move faster or slower and 
the reality that we have a course schedule because we are bounded with the university time, time work. So I'm not sure this is uh, gonna make you happy to answer because we do not have the answer yet. Uh, we try to balance between those two ideas. Yes. That's, that's probably another way. That's probably an activity, probably. So we just poll, ask students, how many of you have done chapter three, for example? We're in chapter one now. So, and then we do some, so this is what part of the thing that we said, we have to be flexible. If we see that kind of happening, then probably we need to, to in, change our instruction a little bit by, like, like you said, just by inviting those people to share what they are finding, what they learn about this. That's another thing. So I think, I think the difficult part here is as soon as we have a very concrete, linear, and linear model, it's very difficult to make a flexible. I think the word flexible is easy to say, but it's difficult to implement. But, but I think we have to be sensitive, even, even based on my experience, even we have our online materials ready for eight weeks, nine weeks. We change things in the middle based on the feedback. So our, ten, our, our technologies guy, well, we have a team of people who help us making it happen. They have to be adaptive. They have to be flexible because in the middle of the semester, we change a lot of things based on their feedbacks. So that's what we said about flexibility. That's, that is, that is difficult, but we need to consider that, yeah. Any other comments? Yes, please. Lower classes or face to face? Oh, normal, okay. Face to face, you mean? Okay. No, I think it's a very good question. I, I think it's a very good, legitimate question, and I think there's a lot of people ask the same question. I have the same question, too. But I think it's very depend on the design of your online. If you have a very bad online design compared with a good face-to-face, -face, of course, face-to-face -face is going to be better. This, reversely, you can say that if you have a very good, well-developed well design online, and then you compare it with bad face-to-face, -face, there is a bad face-to-face -face class, obviously. You know, then you compare those two, then it's not, it's not fair. But I think your question is the study, research, what research show. Again, it's mixed, but most, most of the literature that I read is more toward, if it's, if it's not better, it's exactly the same as the face-to-face. -face. But that's based on many research. Yes. Synchronously.
I think, I, I, I think, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a, I think your question is more about evaluation than anything else, about is assessments, how can we make sure that uh, whatever we assess is accountable? Okay, so. When you said 100,000, is it you're saying 100,000 students online? Yeah, I think that's, I think Andy Walker can answer that better because he has more experience on MOOC. And I have, to be honest with you, I never designed an online module for MOOC with this, with plenty. Yeah, but I, again, to be honest with you, I do not have experience teaching that big. The biggest class I have ever teach for online at the University of Illinois is 32, 33, 32. So I, I, do not have, I did not have experience with that big class. Uh, but uh, I also evaluate uh, online learning master program mechanical, not mechanical, all engineering co online courses at the University of Illinois in 2004. I evaluate their programs. So the same question I asked them, how do you give them tasks, for example. So this is for master degree. And they said, well, we, 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 we ask them to go to the center. So if they are located in Prairie, then they have to go to the nearest campus at the University of Illinois there to take tests there. So basically, it's just like a regular test. They have to go to the center uh, to take the test. But I do have experience on my own departments at the University of Illinois where the online class is require us to take tests online. And there is a technology I think Travis will be able to share with us where, where uh, they, they, well, actually, there is a limitation of technology, but it's basically the technology that I'm talking about is they, they require, they, they, they force me to solve the problem within certain minutes. And by doing that, there is no time for me to look over books or even talk to somebody else or ask help. So that's, that's, all, that's what I have experienced. We do have time? I, I'm sorry, I think he raised his hand if it's okay with you. I think it's online and it's not for everything and not for everyone, everybody. The reason I have, a, we have an online at the University of Illinois and the HRE online is because it's a specific topic, specific degree, and we have students from all over the country. I mean, from many different countries. Okay, uh, with this another challenging too about synchronous sessions because seven o'clock in, in, in Urbana probably is four o'clock in the morning in Singapore or something. So that's great, another challenge. Uh, well, I would like to conclude my, 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 my sessions, if I may, by saying that, well, why don't we learn together? I would like to learn more about this, obviously, by designing a class. And if you are planning to design your online class, probably you, probably CD can, CD can facilitate that by having some kind of a forum where we can sit together and brainstorm and let design our own class and using any, anything learning theory that we like to pick. That's probably more tangible result rather than uh, uh, just a seminar.
that's just my suggestion. Thank you very much.